Now, speaking of the mission, and speaking of Thursday nights, we, um, we went this Thursday, and um, we had a good time. And um, I know that Don and Debbie were there, Don and Debbie also, um, quiet little church mouse kind of people that you don't ever hear anything out of, but you see their fingerprints all over the place. They both counsel uh, down front on Sunday mornings with people making professions of faith in Christ or needing baptism or church membership or whatever, and they have really rolled their sleeves up um, that I know of at least as last year and really gotten busy and hit the ground running and been serving in the mission and other places. And Don, you're a deacon, right? And you're also serving the media. Uh, what, we were all shocked about that, that they would actually find use for your skills in the media sec uh, section, but uh, they're doing a great job loving the Lord, serving the Lord. And um, so Don or Debbie or both, we're going to share a little bit about Thursday night. Um, so Don, go ahead. Good morning, everybody. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the Memphis Union Mission. Uh, just in case you don't know, it's the second Thursday of the month, every month. We, uh, we've been going for about a year up there, and it's kind of like just what Tony was talking about one time. You know, it's after I've been working all day on Thursday, do I really want to go down there? I want to go to the Friday morning breakfast. Am I going to be able to get up on time and, and go to that? And then I go down there, and I see Clayton down there. He's, he's got to be there at 3 o'clock in the morning to cook breakfast the next morning, so mm -hmm. he kind of made me feel bad. So anyway, we've been going down there for about a year, and I, I can honestly say it's been a super blessing every single time we've gone. I, I get energized. I'm not tired. We get, I think we get more out of it than they do. Mm -hmm. Just in case you don't know, Jim and Nick's barbecue down here on Germantown Parkway, they cook the barbecue for us. Uh, I think we go and buy the meat down at Costco and then give it to them and they cook it and we bring it up there and we have barbecue and beans and hand that out. Just so you know what normally happens on a Thursday night is uh, we show up at the Memphis Union Mission on Poplar downtown and uh, first thing we do is we take the barbecue and, and the beans and the potato salad and the cookies and serve that to the workers there. After we get through with that, then we move the carts into the main room. And there were about 200 men up there this Thursday night. Debbie and I were working the lemonade stand, and, and John Luce was really, really working us hard. And we got everybody served and came back in there, and then we got to eat a little bit. And then we go into the worship service. And we had, if you look at the pictures up here, you can kind of see some of the things that happened. Uh, we had some singing, and then Tony got up and preached, and he gave a great lesson on Mephibosheth. Um, name you don't hear all that often, but. It, uh, one of the things I remember from that lesson was he talked about at the end, in my opinion, this person represents God the Father, this person represents Jesus, this person represents the Holy Spirit. It was just a great lesson. I got a lot out of it. And then after it was over, Tony gave an invitation and several men came forward. And Debbie and I had the privilege of counseling a, a couple of those guys. Uh, one guy was in a wheelchair. His name was Daryl. We talked to him. He wanted us to pray about his family, so we did that. And then when we were through with him, Tony handed us another guy and his name was also Daryl it kind of reminded me of that TV show Daryl my other brother Daryl yeah, yeah. We, we talked to him and uh, he had actually received Christ as his savior that night hey. and, I, and I said is this something you did right now and he goes yeah I've been thinking about it for a while but tonight is the night I made the decision Amen. so Debbie and I talked to him and said no, you know that you're not good enough to get into heaven you need Jesus for that right yeah, he understood and then we talked about some means of growth reading your Bible and attending church and having fellowship with other Christians Christians, you know, all I can say it was just a real blessing, and Debbie and I were just praising God all the way home that night. So, thanks for the opportunity. It's on the second Thursday of, of every month. If you want a real blessing, come down there and join us sometime. Mm. Mm. Thank you. Yes, I, I really enjoy uh, helping in this ministry. These are like unchurched guys. This is their only opportunity maybe to hear the gospel message and an opportunity to um, ask questions and ask for prayer requests. I also wanted to share with you that we had a little unchurched fifth grade girl accept Christ at the Kids Beach Club mm. Monday. So it's Amen. been a great week. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Debbie. Amen. All right, I tell you, it's a blessing, too, to be preaching down there at the mission on second Thursday and look up and see people that you know and people that are, you know, just there to pray and encourage and minister to the um, folks. I, Don, I don't know that we said it, but you can show up at 5 o'clock there to begin to serve, and uh, then the service starts at 6, and Mike Rebick sang uh, three or four songs that night. It's just a great time of praise and worship. Okay, if you have your Bibles with you, I'd like to invite you to turn to Romans 14. 
Romans 14. Was somebody else supposed to say something or wanted to say something as, as y'all are turning to Romans 14? I was thinking I'm forgetting something. It's your son, uh, grandson Joseph, right? Joseph, good to have you with us this morning, brother. Amen. Leg doing good, healing well. Y'all keep praying for Joseph, okay? So, Kathy, we have uh, Mr. Valentine, a guest of ours today. I know in the blue shirt there sitting back here. Y'all say good morning to Mr. Valentine, if you would, please. Good morning, yeah, good morning, Mr. Valentine. Good to have you. Thank you very much for that vote of confidence and that uh, show of honor. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. He's a keeper. Let's keep him. He's a keeper. I think he's one of us, yeah. right? I think he's one of us. Am I, yeah, Richard. Does anybody not have an outline that Sonny Castell came in? Yeah, and that's a summary and a conclusion from last uh, study we did in Romans 13, okay? So here's what I want to do this morning, if you will indulge me. I want you to look into Romans 14. I want you to read it for yourself right now. There are 23 verses, rather than me reading them all. And I know you're happy I didn't say stand for the reading of the Word of God through all 23 verses. But nothing wrong with that, but just not this morning because you'll stand in the service. But if you would just read Romans 14, read it. Just read it. Just read it. There's no further instructions at this point. What were the two points of conflict that Paul addressed in chapter 14? What were the two points of conflict? What were the two matters that um, he's addressing? This is the church meeting at Rome. He's headed to Rome. He's headed to Spain, ultimately. He wants to come to Rome and spend some time in fellowship, maybe take up a collection. First, he's going to go to Jerusalem, which, of course, he stayed there and was martyred there and never made it to Rome. But he's addressing something that's happening in Rome because of the mix of Jewish and Gentile believers in the church of Rome. What was he addressing? What were the two issues of point of conflict? What they're eating and drinking. What they're eating and drinking and what else? The day of worship. The day of worship. Or anybody else? Got not being a stumbling stone. Not being a stumbling stone, which kind of ties back in, right, to these two points of conflict, right? Food and drink. Food and drink. Show me where you're, show me where you're coming from that. Sam, you started over here a little bit, so show me where you're coming from with that. says in verse 2, one person believes he may eat anything, but one who is weak eats only vegetables. So that was a conflict. Some people were sacrificing food to idols, and that's how it all tied together. So the believer said, well, you can eat that because it doesn't make any difference, but if they're weak and you don't want to eat things to idols, well, then you shouldn't because that's what you believe. So... Either way is right, but you don't want to become a stumbling block to new believers. And so you say, well, that's fine. That's what I got out of it. You got a lot out of it. I wish I had brought my black marker. Yeah, we're running out here. Yep, last word is preference. So there were, there, there are convictions that are involved here, but there are also preferences that are involved here, right? Okay, who, somebody else. Where'd you get that? Where'd you get that from? Where, uh, who said this over here? Was that you, David Skiris, that said about the observing certain days and that? Where'd you see that at in here? If you get a real paper Bible where you can see it, it'd be, it'd be a little easier to read. I mean, paper... <laughs> This is a real Bible right here. It's made out of paper. Verse 5. Yeah, verse 5. Looks like one person esteems one day above another. Somebody else has another. Or they say any day is okay. And it appears to be the day that they set aside as hope. Yep. When you have two bodies, everybody's right, you're right, y'all are digging into it good. I just want us to learn how to dig out things and truths from the Bible ourselves and so that I'm not always doing the one who's doing the teaching. You, the Holy Spirit is the teacher. You get that, right? The Holy Spirit is the teacher. Um, there were people coming from two completely different cultures. And you have the Jewish people who are coming out of um, the, uh, the, the law and the prophets, and they're bringing in traditions, and they're bringing in heritage, and they're bringing in history, 
and they're bringing in Jesus Christ. And so the, the, the conflict here was, is it all this plus Jesus? Remember, this is all about the gospel. The book of Romans is all about the gospel and how the gospel affects, impacts, and influences every area of a believer's life, okay? So they're saying, is it all this history, heritage, observance of certain days, and holy days, and do we need to keep and do all that, and Jesus too? And then you have the Gentile believers, and a lot of this, some of this started at Pentecost as they moved back to Rome uh, on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was sent. And then you have the Romans there around there where the church made up predominantly of Jews. You've got to remember this. The church is made up at this point predominantly of Jewish people, right? So now in Rome, they start bringing in a lot of other um, um, Gentiles. And so the Gentiles are hearing the gospel, and they're being uh, saved, and they don't have all this heritage and history, and they don't have all this law and the prophets, and they don't even know about that kind of stuff. So you have these two cultures clashing, if you will, coming into this church. How many of you know, anytime there's growth or movement, there's friction? <laughs> there's just always going to be some level or amount of friction. And so um, I liken it unto, and I'm going to use this example because I think it's one we can relate to. I thought about that uh, this week some. And that is, I'm going to liken it unto when um, Faith Baptist Church here some years back began to see a lot of folks come in from, Sam, you're with me here, uh, another church, okay? And you had people who had been at one church and they did things that way. And then you had people at Faith Baptist Church and I was here at the time. We've been here, I guess we've been here now 11 or 12 years, Debbie and I. And this all took place maybe six, seven, no more, about eight years ago. So you had these two kind of different mindsets and people and you had what people saw was the right thing to do and what they thought was the wrong thing to do and how to quote, do church, so to speak. It's actually a testimony to really to people who are here to this day who worked through those things. Whether you really knew it or was aware of it, you might have felt some of it, okay? And if you came here from somewhere else, you know you left certain things behind, okay? Then you brought certain things in. But people were here and they had come from other places. So you got all this going on in a church, same way it was in Rome, now add to that that you had people with really, really different, different backgrounds and roots, okay? So that's what's going on here. And just like in the book of Corinthians, the Apostle Paul had to address some issues and things that they had going on uh, at the church at Corinth. Um, these were two things that apparently came to the forefront here at the church that was forming uh, in um, Rome. They had to do with what food to eat. Uh, if you look at verse 2, it says one person has faith that he may eat all things. But he who is weak eats vegetables only. Now, that's not necessarily an a, a, a admonition to be vegetarian, okay, or to be a vegan, okay? If you are, great. That's wonderful, okay? Just don't push that on me. I like a hamburger, okay, every now and then. But that's not what that is about, okay? This has to do with, if you go back even to the book of Daniel, remember Daniel when he said, test us now with, he didn't want to eat the king's food, remember? He didn't want to eat the king's food. You remember that? And you remember why he didn't want to eat the king's food? Because they pretty much knew, hey, this was a, a meat that probably had been sacrificed to idols. It might have still contained blood in it, and they were supposed to refrain from eating meat with blood. And I know it's kind of gross, and I apologize. But Daniel went and said, hey, just let us have vegetables. And the guard said, no, no, if I do that, then I'll lose my head because you guys will get sick and weak, and they'll know that, and, and they'll, they'll know why, and... He said, no, just test us now in it for about 10 days. And the Bible says after eating vegetables only and honoring God, because that's what they were doing, okay, they didn't want to violate their what? Conscious, right? God honored that, and they said they were stronger and looked better and healthier than the people who were eating the meat and the vegetables. So there are, there's, there are reasons and precedents for doing this. Um, some people still held on to that, and that was coming into the church. And so what we have was, does anybody have a King James Version Bible? Anybody? Who? If you look at verse 1, do you, do you mind reading out loud? Um, is that okay with you, Jeff? Do you mind? Just read, read verse 1 because I think we only have two or three King James Bibles in here. And I want us to hear because there's a term, there's a phrase in there that I love. And I started writing it on the board. Go ahead and read that and I'll pick up on it. Him that is weak in the faith, receive ye, but not to doubtful disputation. There it is. 
<laughs> not what does that even mean? Not for not to doubtful dispute. I love that. I just there's something about that that has a ring about it. And I wanted to write it on the board. It's the doubtful disputations. That's King James. What does doubtful disputations even mean? What does that mean? Receive them as they are without uh -huh. any conditions. Receive them as they are without any conditions. All right, in reference to, um, I know you can't see that any better, but doubtful disputations. I love that. I probably spelled that wrong. Don't laugh at me. Dis, pew, right, tations. For some reason, I just like the way that sounds. Doubtful disputations. That means things that you would differ on, like you just said, be things that may be debatable. Down here in my notes it says not to split hairs. Not to split hairs. <laughs> <laughs> he had to bring hair up, didn't he? <laughs> you still got some, Tony. I got some, yeah, in my ears. Um, overshare. Overshare. Doubtful disputations. Not to split hairs. Now I'm going to ask you a question. I'm going to ask you a question. And I told Debbie, I said, I may ruffle some feathers when I ask this question, but I'm going to do it anyway. When you look at the two points of conflict that had to do with food and observance of certain days, and you looked at people feuding, fussing, and fighting over things like this, when it's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ that they're needing to promote, and to infiltrate the world with, and they need to be focusing on the world and ministering in the world and influence and impact and being salt and light. When you boil it down to these two things right here, and they're, 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 they're backbiting each other and judging, and the Bible says, or does it not say here down in verse 4, who are you to judge the servant of another? To his own master he stands or falls, and it says one person regards one day above another. Uh, they, they, not one of us lives or dies for himself, but we live and die, verse 8 says, for the Lord. And we're, we belong to the Lord. Verse 10 says, why do you judge your brother? I want to ask this question. How much different are we today than the Pharisees were of Jesus' day? Who? You know, there's not a real, I don't think today, an issue about what people eat. Today. Come on, you're leading me right into where I'm going. But instead of putting food or drink, put in uh, a style of worship. You know, style of music. That's more prevalent. Come on, I have a whole list of them here. We're, you know, <laughs> we're headed there in just a minute. You know, we, we want to, you know, Choke on a gnat <laughs> in yeah. an argument. Yeah, yeah. Or a degree of sin. Um, yeah. and, and, and we'll debate just trivial things out of really selfishness because we want to consider our sin, ourselves as being right. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. I got one better. Tony. Come on. Um, Pastor Danny is. Uh, in my opinion, is um, challenging the church right now. Um, if you notice the last two Sundays that he's preached, he's really uh, begged for mm -hmm. uh, people to be engaged in his sermons. And in the Southern Baptist Church, sometimes we have this mentality that we just come and he or the message is delivered and that's it. I was at Germantown Baptist many years ago, and I sat toward the front of the church, and <laughs> Pastor Charles would preach, and every so often, it hits me, and I can't, it's like Pastor Stanley said last Sunday, when it hits you, the spirit, you can't hold it back. Mm. And sometimes, in, in my opinion, in the Southern Baptist Church, we have this <laughs> mindset that doesn't take all that. Mm -hmm. Well, I was at Germantown Baptist, true story, many years ago. And I say amen. <coughs> I say it somewhat out loud. Amen. It, it, when Pastor Charles, if he said something that struck a nerve, I couldn't control it. <laughs> and true story, this gentleman walked up to me one Sunday. 
and this is the time that I just joined, and he said, uh, can I ask you a question? He was about 71. He said, I see on Sunday sometimes you are vocal. And I said, well, what do you mean? He said, I hear you a lot of times say the word amen. And I said, uh, yeah. You said amen. <laughs> I said to myself, this is a great time for me to minister to this guy. And he said, you know, I've been coming here for years. I never saw the need for that. It didn't take all of that. Mm. And I was, I, I was kind of shocked I didn't know what to say to this guy. Mm. But I said, well, Darren, this is a good time. He probably doesn't go to Sunday school. He's probably not in church. He's probably just been a bench warmer. And I said, do you attend Sunday school? He said, I'm a teacher. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> so, going to your question, doubtful dispensation, it's like a gentleman said here, as a church, in the first part of my Bible, it says, the first verse says, receive. And so you have people that are different from us, that in turn worship differently, sing differently, but whatever it takes, and I think Paul was probably trying to pull the people together and look, hey, that's going to be a guy here that don't look like you. That's going to be a person here that doesn't speak like you. That's going to be a situation where some people don't eat the same things that you eat. But all in all, we come together to serve God. Get it ready. You got it ready? Hold on. You just get it ready. I'm going to say a few things. Amen. Amen. And you know what? I'm going to change one thing that you said, and I'm going to make it true about me. I can control myself from not saying amen. I choose not to control myself to say amen because if the man preaching the word of God says something that I say, man, that's right, amen, there's nothing wrong with that. I choose to say it. It's not that I can't control myself. It does sort of just want to bubble up and come out, and I get that too. But you can take a little bit farther, amen, yeah, that's right. You can take a little farther too. How about lifting hands in church? I mean, some people are like, man, what are they doing? It's all showy, it's emotion, blah, 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 blah. Well, not really, not necessarily. It can be, but that's between that person and Jesus, okay? Not between me and Jesus. Okay. Doubtful disputations, okay? It goes back to style, and it goes back to the music. And so I'm, we're going to get all there, and we're getting there. I'm, y'all are warming up. We hadn't left the gate yet. We're at the gate still. We hadn't even gone, got on the tarmac yet, okay? But I'm going to say a few things, and I'm going to play a video here in a minute because I think somewhere in here we'll all see ourselves at one time or another, and hopefully we can avoid being, quote, that person down the road. When the Bible says there, accept, you know what that means? That means to receive. Verse 1. Now accept, it means to receive. Watch this. It means to welcome. We don't know how to distinguish between accepting and approving. Watch out. Come on. <laughs> I had to say it. We don't know how to differentiate. You're all, some of y'all looking at me funny like, I don't, need, what, I don't what is the difference? Well, think about it. Just dwell on that. There's a huge difference in accepting and necessarily approving. I can accept your, you, you're with me, right? I can accept you. I can accept the fact that you hold that position about that certain day or the way Sunday should be observed. And I've got a Baptist faith and message that I'm going to read to you, if not today, next week, that was written in 1963 and then one that's written in 2000. And you're going to be shocked. You're going to be shocked at what it used to say versus what it says today. And this is the Baptist faith and mission statement, okay? So I need us to understand that when Romans chapter 14 is telling us, for the spread of the gospel, for the good of mankind, we need to learn to accept one another, but not for doubtful disputations, not to nitpick and split hairs. I've got a video. I want you to watch it. See if you see yourself in it anywhere, and if you, you may say amen, you may say oh me. It's a little funny, it's kind of humorous, but watch it, okay? Go ahead, Don. Really, I'm the uh, local rep for ChristianMingle.com. Uh, recently, we've got some reports of people not acting very Christian on dates. So, uh, new company policy, now whenever anyone registers for the site, uh, they send me over to the house, and I just do a quick look around, ask them a few questions just to make sure they're Christian. Hey, uh, Brittany, I'm with uh, Christian Mingle. We just got your application. No, what do you mean? I didn't sign up for Christian Oh, yeah, Mingle. one of your friends signed you up as a joke. Okay, everybody says that. And uh, when did you get saved? I think 12, maybe. Youth Camp First Baptist Church. Okay, and uh, do you still go there? 
Yes, but it's not called First Baptist. Plus, that's something more like trending now. It's like Mosaic or Cross Point or like Watermark. Thrive Church, actually. Yeah, you walk into the building, you're not sure if it's a church or a Banana Republic. Hey, Chad, I'm with Christian Mingle. We just got your application. I just need to come over quick, ask you a few questions. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Just take a look around the house. Okay. Just make sure I everything's didn't good. Okay, Is this even legal? Pretty fast Wi-Fi you got here. You got a filter on this thing? I'm going to give you a mainstream band. You give me the Christian equivalent. Justin Timberlake? Toby Mac. Katy Perry? Francesca Battistelli. Uh, Nickelback? Uh, skillet? Okay, and uh, Switchfoot? Switchfoot. If I could just get a couple of dates of attendance for you here, just for background. Uh, Choir of the Fire? 98. Uh, True Love Waits? 2000. Promise Keepers? 04. Passion Conference? 2010. And Catalyst? Pre-registered last week. Uh, anything information we need to know in here? Oh, what do we have here? That's gonna be a problem. While I was having a look around, I did find your phone. You took my phone? Yeah, just a couple things quick I want to go over with you. Looking at here, uh, Tinder and Snapchat are on page one. And your Bible app is on page two in a folder, and it needs to be updated. Look, Google Plus? I mean, Christian or not, who's using Google Plus? In 2011, I noticed that you favorited a tweet with a swear word. Okay. Mission trips? Uganda, 2009. Dominican Republic, 2011. Oh. And World Race, 2013. Okay, so two? No, that's three. Okay, the World Race? Uh, I'm talking about real mission trips. We don't count church-sponsored sightseeing tours. Oh, what do we got here? That's gonna be a problem. We've heard it all recently. We've got reports of people going to R-rated movies. Hold on, Left Behind, is this the Kurt Cameron version? I don't think so. Okay. We've heard of people not praying before meals. Let's say you're a nice young Christian woman and we're on the Christian mingle date. Things are going well, but we're back at your place eating popcorn and watching Fireproof. Is this okay? Yeah. Okay, love the book collection. Uh, these candles are a little too Catholic-y for me. What about this? Sure. No! And Michael's or Hobby Lobby? Hobby Lobby. And Alta or Sephora? Sephora. Wrong. Trick question. Christians shouldn't be that concerned with outward appearances. Are you serious? Walgreens is fine. Target, maybe. Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders. Love's like a hurricane. I am a tree. I can't feel my face when I'm with you. But I love Well, you shouldn't love it, and you shouldn't know that song. Is that safe for the whole family? I don't think so. I'm going to be real honest with you, Brittany. Uh, I just... I'm not seeing the fruit. I don't know what else I can tell you. I... I volunteer at a soup kitchen on Thanksgiving. I work in the church nursery every week. I got a Bible verse tattooed on my shoulder. In Hebrew. Okay, Republican or Democrat? Republican. Global warming. No evidence. Stem cell research. Don't know what it is, but I'm against it. Guns. Love them. Obama. Hate him. Welcome to Christian Mingle. I mean, I hear what you're saying, and on paper, things look great, but uh, I'm going to be real honest with you. Uh, yoga pants? Like, I... Personally, I just don't see how someone could be a Christian and wear yoga pants. If there's anything I can do to prevent someone from a life of destruction, I feel like my work here is done. And I'm out of here. And don't even bother reapplying until you get rid of those yoga pants, get some Don Miller books added to that collection, you get a letter from a compassion child up on that fridge, okay? Do you get the point? Do you get the point? Where, you know, where does it end? I mean, where does it end? Where does it end? You have in the Roman church here people who are predominantly Jewish membership, and they come in with the law, their heritage, traditions, etc. Then you have brand new believers. They're young in the faith. They're like Gene Megan sitting over here, right here. You know, they just came in off the street, man, and got saved, you know, a couple months ago. And they're learning and growing. And the last thing they need to hear is a whole bunch of infighting and backbiting about what somebody's wearing or listening to or how they're dressed or whether they have yoga pants or it's the Kirk Cameron version of Left Behind. I mean, you know, that kind of thing. And then you have a growing Gentile population that's their total pagan and their cultural influence, and they're bringing that into the church too. You have rich people and poor people. You have slaves and you have masters. You have differing stages of spiritual maturity. So when the Bible says to accept one another, it means to receive them or to welcome them and we need to understand that there's a big difference between acceptance and approval watch this i want to give you something you need to write this down okay you really need to write this down i don't say that very often but i'm going to say this to you this morning you need to write this down acceptance creates room for growth you with me? Sorry, sorry. Right. I'll write it down and give it to you later. 
Acceptance creates room for growth. To continue. Key, key phrase. Acceptance creates room for growth to continue. Rejection stunts growth. Acceptance creates room for growth to continue and rejection stunts growth. This is all about the weaker brother, stronger brother, weaker sister, stronger sister issue. Okay, that's what it's all about. And the more I dig into Romans 14, the more I see that I actually am in both positions, depending on the issue, depending on the day, depending on what's at work. I have, have been and, and continue to sometimes be in the weaker brother position and sometimes in the stronger brother position. And we'll see how that works and what that all means uh, as we move forward, okay? Look at verse 1 of 14. Accept the one who is weak in faith. Now that means that they're immature perhaps, not as learned, not as biblically uh, educated or knowledgeable. They've just come into the faith, or maybe they've been in the faith a long time, but they haven't really exposed themselves to a lot of theology or doctrine or uh, to, uh, to expository preaching. And they're, they're weak, or they're, or they're brand new believers. You know, they, so... You accept the one who is weak in the faith, but not for the purpose of passing judgment, New American Standard Bible says, of passing judgment on his opinions. You know, how many times we want to pull people in the church and say, okay, now it's my job to change them into me. Hello? It's not mine and your job to change somebody into us. It's the Holy Spirit's job to change that person into Jesus. You got me? Okay. Thank you. One person, verse 2, has faith that he may eat all things. But he who is weak eats vegetables only. The one who eats is not to regard with contempt. And let me tell you, that, that, that phrase right there, regard with contempt, I think uh, your Bible may say something else. It may say passing judgment. Okay? It's not to regard with contempt. That is to actually to despise uh, or, or to reject with contempt. They're not to despise or regard with contempt the one who does not eat. And the one who does not eat is not to judge the one who eats, for God has accepted him. Who am I to not accept you if you differ with me on a certain position or a practice? Or, I don't mean, look, you can't, I don't mean, don't, please don't get me wrong, and we'll talk about this as we move through this. Dude, this is not talking about uh, disobeying uh, biblical commands and clear biblical mandates and clear biblical principles. This is talking about the doubtful disputations to Brian's point. Let me just jump, jump ship here and say, how about the dress code in the church? Just in general, the dress code in the church. It used to be unthinkable, guys, that we would come to church without a tie and a coat on. It was just unthinkable. That's just messed up. That's just wrong. And I even had a man tell me, an older man back in the uh, 80s, he said, we well, you know you shouldn't dress any worse at church than you do at work. And I looked at him, I said, that don't even make sense. You don't even know what I do. You know, if I'm a construction guy out there, if I come to church with a jacket on and no tie, I'm do, I've, I've stepped it up, right? Come on, Brian. At a former church, we actually had a, uh, a church member who was uh, pretty well known in the medical community and things. And and one of the reasons they left because he would bring dignitaries with the mm -hmm. church, and the, the pastor time would have a no tie July. Yeah. And and he he couldn't bring those dignitaries to church because. Because we, they were allowed to come in with no tie, huh? They were, they, they were just, they, maybe they were a little beneath the dignitaries or something. Yeah, didn't want them to know you're associated. What the, the dress code in general? How about this, ladies? Women wearing pants in the church. <laughs> if you want to go a step farther, how about women wearing pants, period? Yep. Oh, my Lord, somebody may see you at Dollar General and go to church with you, and you got pants on in public. <laughs> don't act like you don't go to Dollar General. Uh, <laughs> I'll, yeah. Women wearing pants. How about, how about body piercings? Uh-oh. 
Now he is meddling, plowing close to the corn now. How about body piercings? You see somebody come in and let's say especially a guy, he got two or three, maybe he's got an eyebrow, but I don't, I don't think that looks good and it hurts me to see it just because just I think, oh my gosh, that had to hurt. It's hurting me, but am I to say, pull him aside and say, hey brother, you really shouldn't come to church with that in there right there. Hello? Is that my place? Is it your place? Is it our place? Is that what we're about? Okay, body piercing, especially men. What if uh, some, some of you ladies is like, oh man, that girl, she's got five earrings in one ear. Can you believe that? But let me, let me ask you something. No, no, don't lie. Don't say nothing. You don't have to raise your hand. But you may not have said nothing out loud, but tell the truth. Did you think it? She must be a rebel. She's getting a little worldly to have two. Getting kids. a little worldly. You're getting a little carnal in the church. How about this one? Doubtful disputations. Not accepting one. One eats meat. One eats vegetables only. One observes the Sunday or a different day. A different. They have these uh, feasts and festivals, and um, you got to keep those, or you're not a true Christian. How about Bible translations? Hello. Hello, hello, hello. We all know that the, the, American, the New American Standard is the Bible of choice. This is the one that Jesus quotes from most often. Is the New American Standard. Well, I thought it was Home and Christian Standard. Home and Christian Standard, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, that one's still under review. Um, but there are, I've got a friend of mine in Florida. I mean, we back and forth on Facebook once in a while. He is King James Version only. 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 And you know what? We, I have fun with him. We have fun. He, but he doesn't reject me, and I don't reject him. And we used to work together at French Riviera Spa, and I love him to death. But there's a whole denomination, you understand, or maybe more than one, that says King James only. If it's not King James, they say it's just not right. Okay? So how about that? Come on. Sure. That guy girl comes in here that has that opposite persuasion, verbal talk, and Maybe even the way that they dress. Don't shun them. Don't judge them. Doubtful, dis I can't say that word. <laughs> Whatever it is. But don't do it. God didn't do that to me. Mm. Little boy from Alabama. He didn't do it to me. Mm. Who am I? Who am I? Mm. To possibly judge someone because they're confused. We don't know their history. We don't know what happened to that person as to why they're that way. Sam, you wanted to say something? Speak up a, bit, a little bit, will you? Time and season, everything. Mm -hmm. you know, when a person first comes to Christ, you've know, you, you got to understand that, that, that person is a baby. Mm -hmm. They don't truly understand it. Mm -hmm. Then we also, as believers, we got to realize that uh, the Bible says such was some of you. Uh, mm -hmm. In the book of Revelation, it talks to one of the churches, you know, you have left your first love. Scripture is clear on a few things. Valentine, do you want to say something? Come on. You had your hand up? No. <clears throat> My son converted to Catholicism several years ago. Mm -hmm. Married a real sweet Catholic girl. Mm -hmm. They were perfectly happy. Mm -hmm. He called me and said, Dad, I'm going to the class all and going to become Catholic. Mm -hmm. You know, at first it kind of stung, but then I asked some very important questions because I didn't understand a lot about Catholics. Mm -hmm. They believe Jesus is the Son of God. Do they believe that he came to earth lips to send the slaughter? They believe he died on the cross, was resurrected, and now alive at the right hand of God. He said, yes. I said, cool by me. <laughs> because they had the basics right. 
Mm-hmm. And the um, whole point of Romans 14 being written is so that we would not nitpick, so that we would not judge. The Bible does say make a righteous judgment, and I want to speak to that a little bit, Darren, to what you said, and kind of what we're all saying is that there are clear biblical commands and clear, clear biblical mandates and clear biblical exhortations about certain things. Drunkenness is wrong, the Bible tells that. Homosexuality is wrong, the Bible says that. Lying is wrong, the Bible says that. Thievery is wrong, the Bible says that. Adultery is wrong, the Bible says that. I'm going to say this too, and I am one. Divorce is wrong, but it is in the Bible, and God will forgive. I was divorced when I was 21. I can't undo it. Here we are, okay? But, and you can judge me for it if you want to. But there are things that God says we shouldn't do. There are things that, that our speech, our vocabulary, our thought life, all these things is clear in Scripture what we should not do. But when, you're, when you are a brand new church being formed and you've got people coming in from all cultures and backgrounds and, you, and they have all these different preferences or all these different convictions, you have to leave room for the Holy Spirit of God to speak to those people and to help them grow. The Bible says to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm not the Holy Spirit, and guess what? Neither are any of you. Okay? We can encourage. We can coach. I co you know, me and Eddie say that all the time, coaching somebody up. We can coach people up, Christian, biblically speaking. We can help encourage. We can, we can encounter. We can... Sam, we do this all the time. You and me, you know, we talk about how can we reach somebody with the truth, you know, uh, where they would accept it and, 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 and embrace it and think about it, okay, and incorporate it in their lives. But if we start passing judgment because of some, how somebody observes a certain day or how somebody, what they eat, um, and sometimes even what they drink and even how they dress and we start doing it, how about smoking? We got to go after this, but how about smoking? Um, you know, I, I, I preached out at a church in Carryville many, many years ago. They had ashtrays in the men's restroom, okay? It was Southern Baptist Church. And I walked in there, I was like, okay, maybe I'll change my sermon topic today. But um, the Holy Spirit of God said, don't you dare. I seriously was thinking about it. The Holy Spirit of God said, don't you dare. That's not your place. You preach what I laid on your heart and let it go. And don't come in here acting like you're going to tell somebody what to do. Let the Holy Spirit tell them through the Word of God. How about smoking, though? Would you believe that Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great preacher of yesteryear, who is quoted all the time from pulpits, loved to smoke cigars. He smoked cigars in public, not just in the privacy of his home. Okay? And people gave him heck about it, too. Okay? One guy walked up to him. He was... Uh, uh, he, he did not share uh, Mr. Spurgeon's um, love for cigars, and somebody had given him a box of expensive cigars. And he says, Mr. Spurgeon, what should I do with these cigars? I don't smoke. He said, give them to me, son, and I will smoke them to the glory of God. <laughs> That's a, that he, he absolutely said, I mean, and when I read it, I look at it, I'm like, oh my gosh, can he say that? Can he, is that biblical? Can he do that? Well, what, look at verse 23. Right quick, look at verse 23. I underlined, highlight, and drew a circle, and starred, and asterisk, and all that on this. He who doubts is condemned if he eats. So we might say that guy would be condemned if he smoked because he doubted. He had a problem and a struggle. Jesus had convicted him, don't do that, because his eating is not from faith. And watch this. Whatever is not from faith is sin. Now you tie that back over to verse 5 of Romans 14 where it says each person must be fully convinced in his own mind. You can't just sit around in a vacuum and just say, well, that my mind, I, I, don't, this, I, I say this okay, so it's okay. Or this is how it ought to be, so it ought to be. They ought to be like this, and I made them. No, 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 no. You better go and tie verse 23 in there because that's a, another part of the same truth. Whatever is not from faith is sin. Okay, so you have a guy who was a, a, a church leader and he smoked cigars and other people said, you know what, we can't, you know, that, that's not right. So one day Charles Spurgeon was smoking a cigar out and Dwight L. Moody, y'all heard the name Dwight L. Moody, walks up to him and says, Spurgeon, when, and this happened, I'm not making this up, Spurgeon, when are you going to get rid 
rid of those cigars. He poked right in Moody's big belly and said, as soon as you get rid of that. <laughs> now you laugh, but let me tell you, that's the doubtful disputation things. That's the judging of another brother one way or the other. You get what point? You get the point. You get the Bible's point, Romans 14, okay? Except the one weak in the faith, but not for the person's passing passing judgment. The one who's weak thinks he's strong because he's looking at somebody else saying they shouldn't be doing that or they should be doing what I do. The one who's strong thinks that God has appointed and anointed them to go tell people, say, look, you've got liberty, man. Let it go. Love God and do what you please. In fact, Augustine actually said that. Augustine actually wrote, love God and do as you please. Now, is that scary? It can be. But also, it's biblical. Love God. Think about that. That's the qualifier. Do as you please. You're thinking, oh my gosh. Boy, you really open a can of worms when you do that. I get that. I get it. I get it. But the premise of the point, if you stop and think about it, makes sense because guess what? There's liberty in the Lord Jesus Christ. There's liberty. But guys, watch this but not license. And if you cause your brother, and then we're going to talk about this next week, to stumble and you don't care, you got a problem. Right. When a person is converted, you don't tell them to do that. Right. You teach them, you know, how they should live. I mean, you know, what the Bible says and everything. And the Holy Spirit will lead them in that way. But older, mature believers, like Spurgeon, you know, I, mean, I don't agree with Spurgeon either, but, you know. I know, right, I get it, right. But, you know, you know, he, 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 you know, he got to ask for God for that. You know. Now, here's the, here, I got I to gotta sum this up. We got to go. Let's say you and Spurgeon lived in the same time, okay, and you don't like smoking, and you think it's, for you, uh, apparently I'm going to guess that, that the Lord's convicted you, you shouldn't do it. Not just for health reasons, but for witness reasons, right, for biblical reasons. You think it'd be wrong. Right? Okay. So Spurgeon's smoking in front of you. Now here's where the problem comes in. If you start smoking because he smokes, because he said it's okay, you violated your conscience. The sin is really on you, not on him. However, he caused you to stumble and fall back into sin, so it's really on both of you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your truth. Thank you for your word. God, please help us to get into it. And help your word to get into us. And Lord, teach us, please, how to react and how to act and how to respond to differences in the body. Help us to respect people's differences. Uh, Lord, if we can't do that in the church, we're never going to do it in the world. And the world would never come to know you, Jesus. Lord, it's not our job to clean them up. It's just our job to help catch them and you clean them. And so, Jesus, I pray. That by my life and by my lips and by everything that I do, I will point people to the Lord Jesus Christ. And I'll not try to make put things on people that you've put on me. I don't want to try to turn people into me. Forgive us, Lord, for doing that. Forgive us. Because I know sometimes that makes us feel more comfortable or better about ourselves. But God, I pray that we'll not be judges. And although you have called us to be fruit inspectors, then we'll not be judges. Because who wants to be judged themselves? In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Thank you all for your input and feedback.